Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's our pleasure to have with us for the next um, four weeks, I guess, uh, Dr. Steve Baim. Dr. Baim is the director of the William, how do I pronounce Petsch that? Petsch 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 Contemporary Jewish Life Department at the AJC, and also the head of the Koppelman Institute on American Jewish Israeli Relations there. Um, Dr. Baim will be speaking over the next four weeks about four different dissenting modern Orthodox thinkers. And uh, tonight we'll begin the series with a lecture on Rabbi Dr. Eliezer Berkowitz. Dr. Bain. Uh, evening, everyone. Good to, be, uh, good to be back among friends again. So, um, basically, does everyone have a, uh, a handout? Anyone not, have a, anyone not have the handout? Okay, really, it's just, uh, just to give you some background in terms of where we're going and what the overall game plan is. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with these four thinkers sequentially, one per week for the next, uh, the next four weeks, you know, December 9, 16, 23, and 30. There are obvious commonalities between them. Uh, they, all, uh, uh, they all claim the mantle of modern orthodoxy, yet on the one hand, on the other hand, they were all marginalized uh, by the centrist or modern orthodox establishment. Uh, they all did most of the work uh, in the United States. Uh, however, uh, two of them did go at Aliyah uh, and had enormous contributions uh, there. Uh, two of them were primarily influenced by the Holocaust. And two, the Holocaust was relatively, uh, incons I won't say inconsequential, but not nearly as impactful uh, on their thinking. Um, all had a relationship with Yeshiva University, a uh, relationship that had many ups and downs along the way, some more so, some less so. But again, it's not surprising. As full modern Orthodox thinkers, they all look to the uh, flagship institution of modern Orthodoxy, namely, uh, nam namely Yeshiva. Um, what all four do share in common, and this will be our, really our, uh, our overall framing, uh, framing question, all operated in two very distinct but overlapping fields. The field of Jewish theology, in other words, the relationship of God, man, and the Jewish people, and the field of Jewish law, uh, of halakha. And in many respects, that, uh, it's those two, those two uh, pillars, if you will, that define their modern orthodoxy. So in very broad strokes, uh, we're talking about four thinkers that tried to engage modern culture as modern orthodox Jews, offered some uh, quite uh, challenging and advanced theories, um, attained a good deal of, uh, of uh, receptivity uh, within the Orthodox world, but at the end of the day, all four found themselves marginalized. So our questions, I think, going to be very straightforward. Uh, namely, um, uh, what exactly was their definition of modern orthodoxy? Why was it so controversial? And what were the factors involved in their marginalization? But last and by no means least, what exactly is their legacy? So for the next four weeks, those are our, that's our, our broad agenda. Um, my overall uh, approach usually is to start with some biographies so that you can place pe these people in, uh, in a real life human context. Then we'll talk a bit about uh, their theology, the controversies surrounding them, their marginalization, and then before we break it by 9.15, we'll talk about uh, the issue of legacy, of what exactly do they say uh, to, Jews, uh, to Jews living in the 21st century. So that's the overall game plan. Any uh, preliminary observations, comments, questions? Last time I did this a couple years ago, we had one young man who insisted that the subject should not be taught, whatever the subject was. I told him, so no one's forcing you to come. But he insisted on letting us know he thought the subject should not be taught. So I learned, I learned from that. It's a good idea, though, to ask, you know, ask if anyone here does, does have any questions about the overall game plan. Uh, let me begin, then, in terms of Eliezer Berkowitz. Um, the order I adopted, by the way, is essentially chronological. This is not an order by dint of importance. Um, basically, it's that we're dealing with um, uh, three thinkers who have deceased, and essentially I've given them sort of in the order by which they've passed on. One, obviously, Yvadeh L'Chaim, Aron Yitz Greenberg, um, uh, so I've left him for last. But that's really the order. There's nothing, nothing more hidden there. There's nothing, no subtext of which one is more significant and which one is less significant. That said, let me begin with Berkowitz. Uh, Berkowitz was born in 1908 in Hungary. He attended the Hildesheimer Seminary uh, in Berlin for his rabbinic ordination. 
Um, again, we, a couple years ago when we got together, I tried to draw the distinctions between uh, uh, the Frankfurt Rabbinical Seminary, which was under Samson Raphael Hirsch, and the Berlin Rabbinical Seminary, which is under Ezreal Hildesheim, where they were both established in the 19th century. Both of them were trying to become modern Orthodox rabbinical seminaries, but they, dis they differed very significantly on a wide variety of issues, including uh, the question of attitudes towards Palestine, or Jewish settlements in Palestine, cooperation with non-Orthodox groupings, and the use of scientific scholarship for the purposes of understanding Jewish, hex to Jewish text and heritage. Roughly speaking, and I really say the word roughly, uh, the Hirsch Rabbinical Seminary Frankfurt roughly translates into Yeshiva University. The Hildesheimer Berlin Seminary roughly translates uh, into Yeshiva Tchovei Torah of, of Avi Weiss today. When uh, Rabbi Weiss established YCT, he invoked Hildesheimer as his uh, direct model. Uh, in other words, as his direct paradigm of what to, uh, uh, how to structure the seminary. Obviously, Yeshiva University was not constructed as a Hirschian institution. In other words, they weren't looking at the Berlin, at the Frankfurt Rabbinical Seminary, which was very different in its curriculum. But the Hirsch model of uh, neo-orthodoxy essentially got translated into the Yeshiva University model of Torah Umada. So there's rough correlations, though obviously major differences, and certainly Yeshiva University was very, very far from Hirsch's opposition to Zionism and that of the uh, Frankfurt Seminary. So I don't mean to draw any direct correlations, but there are some overall patterns here, here to speak of. Um, in terms of legacy here, uh, my dear friend, I, all, all of you know, of course, you Nita Langer and I went to school together in, in Boston. We were privileged to study with uh, a Hildesheim <coughs> graduate, uh, Rabbi Isaiah Walkemuth, who became, in effect, the Orthodoxy's premier, premier expert on the question of tefillah and liturgy. Uh, we're very delighted to see in the current issue of Jewish Action uh, that the Orthodox Union has discovered uh, uh, the teachings of Rabbi Walkemuth, and they, they emanate directly from the Hildesheimer Seminary. So Berkowitz attends the Hildesheimer Seminary, um, and uh, he flees Germany, though in the nick of time, uh, in 1939. He took up pulpits in Australia, uh, in Britain, uh, and finally in 1949 came to Boston, uh, where he uh, took up a pulpit. Um, the, at that time was the, uh, the famous uh, Blue Hill Avenue congregation, known as Kilat Adat Yishurun. Uh, it was the uh, premier Orthodox synagogue at the time. But it was a dying congregation. Uh, if you know anything at all about the, uh, the history of Boston Jewry, it was a changing neighborhood. And while Berkowitz was there for seven years, till 1956, uh, the, the show was unable to, uh, to compensate him. And he had a young, growing family at the time. He wrote a letter in the Boston Jewish Advocate uh, indicating that he was forced to leave simply for reasons of, uh, of Parnassah, of earning a living. He hated leaving it because uh, he, was, he felt he was having a direct impact there as a leading Orthodox rabbi in Boston. Uh, he then made the choice, and it became a controversial choice that dogged him to the end of his days, uh, to move to Chicago, uh, where he took up a position as professor of Jewish philosophy at the Hebrew Theological College. I say it was a choice because the alternative would have been Yeshiva University. Um, would he have had a much greater impact there? Quite possibly. But it's a choice he made to go to Chicago as opposed to, uh, uh, to come to New York. Um, beginning at that time, this is 1956, 57, uh, beginning at that time he began writing. Um, he had written articles before that, but from there until his, uh, uh, the time he passed away in the early 1990s. Uh, he composed no less than 19, 19 books. I've given you some of them uh, in the bibliography here. Uh, what I'd like to do is to cover what I call his two major theological works and then deal with his uh, major work of halakha or, or theology of halakha. His, um, the book he became most, most well known for initially uh, was called God, Man, and History. And it was, very clear, it was very clearly meant as a modern orthodox work because uh, what Berkowitz was trying to do was to say, what is modern orthodoxy? Bring Judaism into engagement, both positive and negative, with Western culture. Um, in other words, does Judaism have something to say to Western culture? Does Western culture have something to say to Judaism? Now this, again, was distinctively Hildesheimer as opposed to Hirsch. Hirsch had argued for two separate realms. There is the realm of Torah, and there's the realm of what Hirsch referred to as um, Derech Eretz, which again, we, we often translate that as good conduct, and to some extent that's what it is. But what it really means is nature, uh, general culture. 
But Hirsch, Hirsch's argument was that of two separate realms. The Hildesheimer argument is the, the argument of, uh, of synthesis, that what does Western culture have to say to Jews, and what do Jews have to say to Western culture? It's in this context that um, uh, Berkowitz came to his first very distinctive and critical idea. And this is what began with what set him apart from the rest of the Orthodox world, although the idea itself is, is relatively mild. The idea was the idea of covenant, which as we'll see in future weeks had enormous impact upon the other three thinkers. But Berkowitz is the one who begins writing about it initially. What do we mean by covenant? Obviously the concept of Brit is, is hardly foreign to us. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's well known. But Berkowitz gives it a very distinctive content and distinctive meaning. That what covenant is, is not simply chosen people, God's relationship to the Jews. It is all that. But what, co what defines covenant is partnership. Man and God acting together for the advancement of society. Um, the implication of that, well, the theological implication is where does covenant come from? Uh, it comes not initially from the Brits with Abraham. The initial covenant, if you will, is that of creation. The creation of man, woman, Garden of Eden, society around us. But the real point of it is, is that human beings take responsibility for the workings of creation. God and man become partners. Physically speaking, in terms of human life, in other words, we create human life together. Metaphysically speaking, a human divine partnership in the affairs of society. God cares about man, man cares about God. Again, it's a relatively mild idea, but as we'll see, it is pregnant with implications that Berkowitz draws upon for the next 40 years of his life. Namely, that as opposed to an orthodoxy, which he well knew, um, uh, back, in, back in Europe, and certainly was found here in the States. As opposed to an orthodoxy in which human beings would be relatively passive obedience towards God's command. In other words, the notion of you know, it's written down, therefore do it. No, for Berkowitz, the entire workings of, uh, of society, of halakha, all of this is the workings out of covenant in which the problem with orthodoxy is that it's become too passive. Again, a theme he will develop at much greater length in his later works, but it's already found in God, man, and history. That he's looking to an orthodoxy of active partnership between man and God, rather than an orthodoxy that is purely receptive in nature. Um, this book was uh, around when I was in, in college, and people read it. But Berkowitz became much better known uh, in the early 1970s with um, it wasn't his second book, by the way. I'd say there were 19 books altogether. Uh, some of them were more, more better read, some of them were less well read. Uh, but the book that really um, established his reputation as a thinker worth grappling with, worth, worth studying, was written in the early 1970s, I think 1971, 1972, and it was called Faith After the Holocaust. Uh, it was a time when there were a good number of thinkers grappling with the question of um, how do you believe in God? after the uh, historical catastrophe uh, of a Holocaust, where is divine justice when innocent people are, be, are being killed en masse? Um, in other words, the theological question for, that Berkowitz was raising was hardly unique. His answers were incredibly brilliant, incredibly original, and they're found in this book, Faith After the Holocaust. What are, what are his answers? Um, he developed some interesting models. Again, models that are found deeply within tradition, but he gives them a new twist, a new, he sheds new light on them. The first model is that what is the Holocaust? Hester panim. Anyone care to translate that for us? Hidden face. I'm sorry? Hidden face. Yeah, the face of God was hidden during the Holocaust years. Um, it's originally found in Parshat Vayelach, which states explicitly, God says, Ani astir panai bayom habu. I will cover my face on that day. That's the, the literal translation, if you will. The metaphysical translation is that God is eclipsed from history. Um, God eclipses himself from history. Now, again, we could find this in the, you know, by simply reading Sefer Dvarim. What does Berkowitz bring it? Why does Berkowitz invoke it? He invokes it for reasons that are, I would say, sharply original, and at least in my book, quite brilliant. Um, this has Panim, 
uh, is ultimately a statement of human freedom. In other words, God shields himself, God eclipses himself in order to give man and woman the freedom of choice. If God were really visible, you know, if God really showed himself in all of his divine glory, we would be compelled to believe. In other words, who wouldn't believe under those circumstances? The, what, the argument is that the decision to eclipse oneself, to eclipse God, is essentially to give man the opportunity to be free in one's choice. You then have to carry this through to a number of steps, some of which can be quite disturbing, but I think are, uh, they all follow logically. If human freedom is real, then it must be without limitation. It must be, must be absolute. Um, if I think that I have the freedom to cross the street or not to cross the street, then that, if that freedom is an illusion, okay, it's an illusion. You know, I may just think it's free. But if it's real, that means I could just as easily choose to cross the street or not to cross the street. Well, now talk on the moral level. If human freedom is real, it must be absolute. It must contain within it the freedom to be absolutely angelic, but equally absolutely demonic. What is the Holocaust then? The Holocaust is nothing more and nothing less than the ultimate triumph of human freedom. Now, I say this can be disturbing, namely that um, the priceless freedom is going to mean an awful lot of people getting killed needlessly and senselessly. And the, the opposite point of view, the, those who would disagree with Berkowitz, who would, who would raise this question, would basically say, what kind of a god sits by passively while innocent people are getting slaughtered? Um, Berkowitz's answer is that this is the price of freedom. Um, it's also related to is that that means, again, the covenant is human responsibility. You want to stop the massive slaughter? You have to do it yourself. You have to do it with human initiatives and not relying upon divine intervention. Um, the, uh, there are a number of other corollaries that flow from this, but the, uh, just to dwell on this for a second, the, uh, the implication here um, is that um, <coughs> If you want to understand the Holocaust, many would argue there's no point, no, there's no attempt to understand it. Um, the, the legend is told, I'm not sure how, how accurate it was, but um, uh, in the early years, uh, the legend is told anyway that someone asked Rav Soloveitchik, uh, should, should the Holocaust be taught? And he said, um, well, sometimes it's better not to pose questions that have no answers. Um, now again, I don't know that he actually said it. All I do know again is that when I, when I went to Maimonides many years ago, the Holocaust was an unmentioned subject. Um, but that said, uh, obviously we live in a world in which the Holocaust is part of our historical consciousness. Um, what Berkowitz is, is aiming towards is to understand the Holocaust, first and foremost, obviously as an historical event. But if you want to ask the why question, of what is the, uh, where is God during the Holocaust? Berkowitz is parting company with those on his right who argue punishment for sin. This was the view, for example, the Satmar Rebbe, his famous book, Vayoel Moshe, uh, was Moshe, Moshe Teitelbaum, so Vayoel Moshe, Moses attempted. Uh, Berkowitz has no patience with the view because number one, it's an insult to those who died, uh, and number two, is the uh, it's an attempt to justify God when God needs no justification. Uh, so Berkowitz rejects that, uh, that concept of Ibn Chatoeno. In place of it, he's invoking this model of Hester Panem. I say, though, that there are a couple of other corollaries here. Number one um, is, if you accept that, that God is hidden from history, the events that take place in history are human events. The covenant between God and man means, in effect, man has to take responsibility for the workings of society, then Berkowitz's conclusion, and it's a very sharp one, is that it's Christianity that is guilty, not God. In other words, that um, God is hester panim, God is hidden from history. Who has power in history? The Christian world. Where is the Christian world during the Holocaust? Well, to say the less said the better, but obviously it's, there's much more that can be said. But then Berkowitz comes to his final conclusion. In that context, it is Christianity that stands guilty. It's Christianity that's in need of repair. Uh, it's one of the reasons, for example, Berkowitz opposed Jewish-Christian dialogue. Uh, the Rav opposed it for very different reasons. Um, he felt it, was, uh, uh, it lacked theological integrity. 
Um, uh, Berkowitz's argument is that Christian, Jewish Christian dialogue is, would be, is, uh, is unacceptable or undesirable because the Christian world has much more to atone for, and therefore it's not a dialogue of equals. So that's one corollary, the issue of the approach to Christianity. The other cor corollary then is um, if the Holocaust is hester panim, the state of Israel becomes gilui panim. In other words, obviously historical, historical process is that of 1945, the culmination of the Holocaust, the birth of Israel in 1948. Again, though, Berkowitz puts it in distinctive covenantal context. The what is the state of Israel? The return of the Jews to where Christianity was, namely power history, exercising power in history. Um, it's in this context, Berkowitz argues, as Jews then we now have enormous responsibility that we didn't have before. In other words, the state of Israel is the gilui panim that God once again showed his face, gave the Jews an incredible gift. But the terms of the gift remain the same. Namely, that the workings of the covenant is a human working, a human partnership. Only human beings can, car can carry forth on that. And therefore, the state of Israel will be judged and evaluated by the good or the bad that it happens to do. Um, uh, his last point here, though, before, before we leave this, um, uh, is perhaps the most, uh, the most surprising. This is the, the final corollary, and it's the most surprising. It's the one that, that forced me to think the most about it. But at the end of the day, again, I, I found it to be a very, um, a very sharp insight. Uh, the modern world, as certainly uh, 20th century America, post-Holocaust America, uh, can, can well be defined by the context of the concept of secularization. You know, meaning that people are far more secular today than their parents or grandparents ever imagined. That's sort of a natural process. If anything, America is more religious than most societies. But the overall context of post-Holocaust society, Western culture, is far more secular. Uh, I was always amazed. We, uh, my wife and I took a trip to Hungary a number of years ago. Uh, we stopped the young lady outside of a church, and we asked her uh, who's, you know, who's going to church these days, and she said, no one, the churches are empty. No one my age would ever think of going into church. I was sort of stunned by that because I sort of thought uh, the resistance to communism in Eastern Europe was located in the churches. But it's not the case. In other words, that Europe is far more secularized even than America. Um, so the, the, the existence of secularization I don't think is in dispute. You know, the world is becoming more secular. If you're looking at the Jewish community, just take a look at the Pew study that was released a few weeks ago, which point to uh, among Jews under age, uh, 30, I believe it is, one third do not define themselves as Jews by religion, but define themselves as Jews by ethnicity, culture, or some other secular concept. There are many implications of that for the future of the Jewish community, but that's really for another, another time. So the concept of secularization, I think, is very self-evident. The implication of it for Berkowitz is what's so mind-boggling, so, so original. Secularization for Berkowitz is a religious good. In other words, the fact of secularization, as far as Berkowitz is concerned, is something to be welcomed, something to be embraced. Why? It's man's coming of age that belief in an age of secularization, that's real belief. In other words, it's no, it's no achievement to believe in an age of religiosity. In an age of secularization with this complete freedom of choice, that's when belief really counts. That's when belief really has something to say. Secondly, um, well, before, before we leave that, were there divine intervention? Um, in other words, were we to witness God's acts in history? You know, were we to say, this is the, great, the greatness of the Almighty, that would leave no basis whatsoever for human ethics? Now, again, think about this for one second. What do we mean by ethics? You know, you give charity. We think it's an ethical act, okay? Um, uh, the only thing that makes it ethical is freedom of choice. That I have the right to give charity or not to give charity. But in an age of complete belief, where you see God's hand, you know, where you, uh, you're witnessing God's presence, who would not do the mitzvah, so to speak? Who would not do the right thing? Because otherwise it's like, uh, you know, who are you to stand in the, in the face of this incredible, all-powerful all divine force? It's when God has become eclipsed, when secularization is the norm, that ethics really has meaning because then there is complete freedom of choice. Um, 
There are two other corollaries here, though, that, um, uh, again, I think give some, uh, give some sense why Berkowitz was so controversial, at the same time what would make him a truly modern thinker. Number one is that um, if God is eclipsed, if we're working in the, on the world of secularization, we can have a much more mature relationship with the deity. In other words, that our, our concept of prayer, our concept of addressing, addressing a deity, is not one asking for divine intervention. It's rather trying to elevate ourselves as a spiritual partner. Now, meaning that this entire covenantal relationship between God and man as equal partners, it's especially cogent in an age of secularization. It makes a lot more sense when the, the hand of God is far more hidden, when people are not necessarily religious. What perhaps is the most problematical aspect, controversial of it, is what we said earlier, and this is his final statement, is that taken to its logical conclusion, and this Berkowitz again is unequivocal in saying this, evil, something that we abhor, is actually the gift of God. It's a gift because it gives us the gift of freedom. Um, now, again, I think it's, it, I, I would suggest it's highly problematical because part of me simply says I can do with less evil in the world. Um, but it goes back to what Berkowitz spoke in terms about the Holocaust, namely that hester um, panim, uh, the, the eclipse of God, the hiddenness of God, allows the, permits the Holocaust to take place. Uh, it is the result, it's the ultimate triumph of human freedom. If God had stopped the Holocaust, more lives would have been saved, without question, and maybe the world would be a lot better place. But our freedom would have been curtailed. Um, that's, that's his basic principle here, that um, uh, there's a, essentially a triangle between freedom, moral action, and divine passivity. Um, the story in me says some, uh, some, would put it somewhat differently, and that is that um, uh, the biblical record is obviously a record of um, divine intervention, yet people continue not to believe. Um, the rabbinic record, known as the post-biblical record, would appear to be far less divine intervention. The notion of ein danim babatko. You know, this batko may exist, but we don't, we don't judge that way. And as we'll see this evening, Berkowitz addresses that head on as well. The overall course of history has been movement from human dependence upon divine intervention to greater human self-reliance. Now, that tension is always going to be there. We saw just last, the last week in terms of the holiday of Hanukkah. Uh, on the one hand, Hanukkah is about a Maccabean victory. On the other hand, it's about a miracle of oil. So the two run hand in hand. And it's interesting, the Talmudic account of what is Hanukkah incorporates both. It was not willing to slight one to the expense of the other. I draw from that the conclusion that um, the course of human history has been in the direction of greater freedom. The culmination of human history in the Holocaust is abhorrent, but it's only the result of a growing nature of freedom. Let me just stop here for a second. Any, uh, any comments, observations, criticisms? Okay, well, Sam. Well, I know that Berkowitz was personally a religious person. Yeah. He prayed to God. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Now, surely his prayers were similar to ours where we ask God to intervene. Now, the fact that uh, we have personal freedom to do things and so forth does not, first of all, take away our responsibility for our actions. And I don't think Berkowitz would say that they do. So he is asking, he does ask for intervention. Um, well, again, you wouldn't know that from his writings. Um, in other words, are we, are we praying because of we're literally asking for intervention or we're asking for assistance in making the decisions that need both. to be? Both. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I, I think your point is, is well taken as far as it goes, that the text of the liturgy um, is, a, is a text that Berkowitz, I would suggest, would have some problems with. Look, we, we begin the Musaf prayer on Shabbat by saying, we were exiled from the land because of our sins. Now that's precisely the, uh, the concept that he rejects completely, but I guarantee you, he said it every Shabbat. Anything else? Uh, yeah, a woman over here. Um, the, 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 
<laughs> well, he's building on the second part of it, that, that Yirat Shemayim right, so is, what, is, what, is, what, is what leads to human action one way or another. What's, what's radical about this is that human freedom will result in evil. But the fact of God could prevent that evil immediately. A divine God could put a stop to it. Um, the evil exists in Berkowitz's very radical formulation. It exists as a divine gift in order that we can take ethical or unethical action. Uh, I think he's also rebelling against, it goes back to some of the points Sam was making, he's rebelling against the, um, the, the notion of the god of the thunderbolt. Uh, in other words, that uh, if you're relying upon divine intervention, uh, that's a prescription for disaster. What he values about Israel is that there is no such reliance. That what Israel, the birth of Israel, is the Jews taking their destiny into their own hands. I think it was gentleman here. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I'm from Frankfurt, okay. and I, um, I'm not quite sure about some of the facts that you mentioned. I, I never heard about that Rabbi Hirsch had a rabbinical seminary. He had a, he founded a high school which I went to, yeah. and there was, I, I, I never heard that he had a rabbinical seminary. You, okay, but go, go ahead. Was there something else? And, uh, there was one other thing. No, that's, that's okay. Um, Hirsch was ex very critical of the Hildesheimer Seminary. Yeah, that's possible. Okay. In other words, that, in terms of what what actually took place in Frankfurt, how many rabbis were ordained, um, that I, that I can't speak to. I mean, that you may very well be correct. And there was no there was no yeshiva per se. It's always yeshiva referred to in the text as the Frankfurt Rabbinical Seminary. By Rabbi Breuer, not by Rabbi Hirsch. Uh huh. Okay. All right. So I've collapsed the two. Thanks for the correction. Very good. Yeah. There also is a thought that the state of Israel was going to be created because of the Holocaust. And without the Holocaust, that man would not have allowed the state of Israel to be created. But because of the um, guilt of man, if you want to call it that that the United Nations will vote the partition and so on. Mm -hmm. How does that come into play? For example, if you're talking about that man had, is able to make all the choices and so on, it almost sounds like this is a segue into the next stage. Well, you, again, this is, uh, you know, the problem historians always have is, is the relation between history and theology. Um, historically speaking, uh, it's a harsh thing to say, but uh, no Holocaust, no state of Israel. Uh, unless you believe in divine intervention, history takes a totally different course. But assuming history was going on the course it was going, uh, look, Chaim Weitzman said, we'll get a Jewish state in 50 years, okay? Um, that would have meant a Jewish state in 1998. Tell me the United Nations would vote for a Jewish state today. I mean, that's uh, utter, utter nonsense. So in that sense, uh, the historical fact, I don't think anyone can gainsay. The problematic we have with it is a political problematic, namely that uh, uh, that uh, feeds directly into the view uh, articulated in Arab capitals and, and, uh, and Persian capitals that uh, the state of Israel is uh, a European Christian uh, guilt complex over the Holocaust. Um, the Jewish narrative is the state of Israel's realization of uh, age-old Jewish aspirations. Right. Um, so the historical part of it is problematical. The theological aspect of it um, is um, awarding a Jewish state is hardly compensation for six million who died. And most of the six, not most, but perhaps, yeah, perhaps even most of the six million who died never would have thought that a state of Israel would have been there. Uh, um, so in that sense, the attempt at a theological linkage here is problematical. Uh, what Berkowitz has done is basically to, to say, no one can deny the historical sequence. Um, he then gives two theological interpretations. Holocaust has stir panim, the state of Israel is gilui panim. Sam? No. I could say that, yes, it, it was in part because of the Holocaust. But there were Zionist efforts way before that. Herzl and the Zionist party and, others, and the Balfour Declaration was uh, a response to a, a lot of this. So it's, it's fine to say that uh, there was intervention or that, uh, well, yeah, but still, it was a great part because of the efforts of, Ju of, of the Jewish people. Now, also, what I want to say is that the efforts of the Jewish people do not negate God uh, intervening at times. 
the fact that we are, have, uh, have to do good or evil and decide ourselves which is good and which is evil. But there's a responsibility if we choose evil. Now, wh why is there a responsibility? What evil can become us because we've done something terrible? Would you say that that's God's intervention? I, I don't know. I, I don't think that the two are... No, I, I, I understand. Both. Again, you're, you're offering what I would call the, um, uh, the standard critique of Berkowitz, that um, he is assuming, and uh, philosophically it's, it's probably quite compelling, that for freedom to be real, there can be no divine intervention. His critics would argue that um, when things get too, too hot, um, doesn't God have responsibility to limit uh, human evil? And that, that tension is going I to be there. He does, but, he, but if he doesn't, we look at it. Okay, all right, okay. Um, I'd like to pass to, uh, to his other set of issues. Now, actually, this first set of issues on, on, on the Holocaust did not disqualify Berkowitz from Orthodox leadership. In other words, he's offered some very radical statements, but ultimately, they, they were statements that uh, his Orthodox colleagues, in one form or another, had room for. What was much more controversial uh, was his... Uh, his last major book, actually a very short one, but it re repays reading. It's actually been out of print for many years, but if you can get a copy, it's wonderful. It's simply called Not in Heaven. It's a short book, less than 100 pages, but it's one of the most um, uh, compelling theologies of halacha. Loa um, Shemayim. Loa yeah. Okay, you give the right reference. It starts with a Talmudic tale. Um, famous oven of Achnai, the crooked oven. The dispute between the rabbis and um, Rabbi Eliezer of, is such an oven pure or impure? One, one rabbi says it's impure, the other uh, the rabbis say it's pure, and they start having this debate. And the dissenting rabbi says, well, if I'm right, let the rivers flow upstream. Rivers flow upstream, and they say, proofs are not to be brought from rivers that lose their direction. And he says, if I'm right, let the wall start, wall start caving in. The wall start caving in. The rabbis then respond by saying, this is the reward of Torah, that we articulate the uh, halachic perspective and we get punished for it. So the walls start leaning. And then the rabbis say, proofs are not to be brought from leaning walls. Then he says, if I'm right, let there be a voice from heaven that says I'm right. Sure enough, there's a bot call that comes and says, Rabbi Lezer is right. And the rabbis say, lo ba shemayim we don't, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't make a judgment based on a voice from heaven. At that moment, a debate took place in heaven. Uh, the Almighty turned to his uh, subordinate, so to speak, and said, um, Al tikre, uh, tikre bonayach ele bonayach. My children have conquered me. This is the classic statement of rabbinic political theory of men must make decisions. The halachic process has been given over to human beings. That's the, only the starting point. Um, what makes this so, so um, uh, daring, it takes it into, into new directions, is he then distinguishes between areas that the Torah tolerated and areas that the Torah taught. Now, what are areas that the Torah tolerated? His proof text, again, or starting point, comes from Maimonides. Uh, Maimonides in uh, Guide for the Perplexed, uh, has a rather novel interpretation about sacrifices. Anyone know it? No Maimonidean scholars here? Maimonides argues that sacrifice, I'm sorry, Judy? Just that it's it time limited. Transitional yeah. way to deal with. Right, in other words, sacrifices could not be outlawed because the rest of the world is practicing them. Oh. Therefore, the Torah tolerated sacrifices. But, you know, there are a whole set of halachot of sacrifices. But this is not what the Torah teaches. This is what the Torah tolerates. Berkowitz then says, taking that Maimonidean concept of toleration, he extends it to a number of other areas that could not be outlawed. Slavery is one. And second class status for women, women's disabilities, was a second one. Uh, we'll come to some of the specifics of it, but again, they're well known issues, particularly in terms of marriage and divorce. Thirdly, um, so now the <coughs> second concept is take the Maimonidean view, which the, the 20th century man, the 21st century person will call this historicization. You know, meaning that what the Rambam saw was that some halachot had to be commanded for reasons that were time bound that 
in fact, it, it suggests that the view of human nature is very conservative. <coughs> People change very slowly. You can't legislate overnight. You have to wean the Jews away from sacrifices. It takes a while. In order to do that, you need a transitional period when sacrifices are permitted. Same, as far as Berkowitz goes, the same goes for slavery. How can the Torah tolerate slavery? Because to outlaw it, it would have been completely anathema. You know, Dibra Torah will have shown Adam. The Torah speaks in a language that human beings can hear. If you outlawed it, they would not have been able to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, women's disabilities, obviously, in the ancient world, women, uh, a woman who didn't get married was in an awful lot of trouble. Um, so in other words, any kind of marriage, bad or, bad or worse, was better than no marriage. Um, again, um, this, what we, would, this, we would call this today historicization. In other words, understand the halacha comes from a particular historical context. He then goes to the next question. If that's the case, when does halacha change? And his argument, again, very daringly, but I think in many ways very compellingly, Torah values are eternal. They're not subject to change. Halacha is the meaning of the word, a way. A way to realize those Torah values. Those are subject to change. In other words, the values are eternal. The halachot are subject to evolution, subject to change. Um, he gives some interesting examples of this. The classic one, of course, is Prusbal. Uh, Prusbal is a, uh, you know, it's a legal fiction, if you will, that uh, we, don't, we don't collect debts during the seventh year. Um, so what happens at the, during the sixth year? Uh, wealthy people start loaning out money because they won't be able to collect their debts. So at the end of the sixth year, the court develops a bill, a document, a principle, that gives the court the right to collect the debts on behalf of the, of the lender. Now, in practice, this has completely, uh, completely changed the halachic the imperative. But the value remains the same. Uh, however, in order to advance justice, to permit people to continue borrowing, the halacha itself underwent an evolution. Um, gives a second example, much more, much more, uh, much less well-known one, but it's 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 right there. Uh, the concept of an, an ox who has gored an individual more than twice, what we call a shor muad, you know, an ox who's uh, who's been used to goring people. According to halacha, you know, the statement is, according to the text is explicit. Hashor yisakel the gamba love yumat, the the ox must be killed, and its owner should also be killed as well. The owner is guilty. He knows what kind of ox he has. You know, he should have taken better care of the ox, and therefore he's guilty. But along comes here, the, the, in other words, the value is there. The value is eternal. But the owner of the animal bears responsibility. The halacha changes. <coughs> that instead of murdering, not mur instead of killing the man, uh, Freudian slip there, instead of killing the man, we insist upon compensation. Now, these are some of the examples that uh, the Berkowitz argues that historically there has been halachic change. Sam? Well, you could have taken it from the ayin tachat ayin. That's right, he does that. Um, I just gave you a, a whiff of a taste there. Um, he then goes even to the future. And he, draws, he draws this fascinating midrash that when the Messiah comes, he will invalidate all mamzerim. Um, in other words, there'll be no mamzer. Now again, if you think about it, um, it, would, it would sound a little bit silly. How can the, how can the Messiah you know, declare, declare that a mamzer is not a mamzer? But again, Berkowitz saw that in very metaphysical terms, that the whole concept of punishing the children of a, an adulterous or incestuous union would be a violation of Torah ethics. Therefore, as long as the Messiah is not here, our job is to make sure that there's no such thing as a mamzer. In other words, to somehow invalidate the concept so that mamze root does not exist. Um, what this amounts to is a, a theory of halakha in which, again, the covenant has taken place. It's been given over to human hands. Our job is to fulfill the divine imperative. What that means is that we make decisions. The decisions may be flawed, but we have to make them in order to advance as much good and minimize as much evil. 
he gives a very uh, theological justification for all this. And again, it's, it's daring and in, in many ways very sharply original. Um, the Jewish world is in exile. It's a fact of history. You know, in other words, the, uh, we were once in our land and we've left our land. Um, uh, fortunately, we have the opportunity to go back, but we still, we still live in a, in a galut. Um, Berkowitz's argument is that it is not only the Jews that are in exile. The halakha is in exile as well. What does it mean the halakha is in exile? The halakha became codified. In other words, once the Jews left Palestine, the halakha became subject to codification. Codification was necessary because the Jews were so far flung. But the act of codification became a halakhic straitjacket. In other words, it didn't allow for the same process of halakhic development. If Berkowitz has a program here, and I think in large measure it is very programmatic, is that we have to continue doing what we always have been doing, which is that of halakhic development. But we stopped doing so, because not only were we in exile, but the halakha became in exile as well. Our response to the halakhic exile was codification, and that codification uh, meant, in effect, a straitjacket of halakha. And then, you know, let, lest you think this is, this is over, lest, lest think it's over, the, it's over the top up until now, one more step really over the top, now that we have a state of Israel, we're even more in exile. Why? Because the chief rabbi of the state of Israel is the greatest believers uh, in the straight jack. Um, now again, he gives, a, he gives a daring example here. Again, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an area of halakha where I really know nothing whatsoever, so I wouldn't even, I wouldn't presume to, um, uh, to look into, I wouldn't even presume to, to pass judgment on it, but it's, um, it's one of the most controversial areas of, of the place of halakha in a Jewish state. The issue of autopsies. Um, Berkowitz's argument is, is that a medical school engaged in medical research must have autopsies. The ban on autopsy uh, is, again, a halachic ban, however, subject to other conditions. Now that the covenant is in our hands, and we have to continue engaging in halachic development, to refuse to do autopsies in the state of Israel because it's a Jewish state is once again to impose